boom and uh, doom. Mark Faber is our squawk master of the market. And uh, I know there's no, uh, we found out, Mark, and I'm glad to know there's no commas between gloom, boom, and doom. The one thing that, that I do need to ask you, gloom and doom are bad, and a lot of times you are uh, somewhat pessimistic. Is the boom as in boom times, or is it in something more negative, like the financial markets blowing up or something? Is, is, boom, is, is boom, do you acknowledge that there can be positive things at once in a while? Is that what that means? Well, I think that uh, asset markets move up and down, and they go from a rising phase into a boom phase and into a collapse, and then people are gloomy. And there is a gloom and doom around, and then the markets bottom out, and then the whole process starts again. So I think as an investor, you have to realize occasionally markets are overvalued and occasionally they're undervalued. Where are we now, Mark? And, and you were, it hasn't been that long. It's great, great to see, by the way, because normally uh, it, it's hard to get on camera and we have you on, on, on the phone. But m more recently, if I understand correctly, you're very concerned about how much uh, paper is being printed by just about everyone in the world at this point, and therefore you like, uh, like things like gold. Well, I think in general, if you have sound money, then uh, money is a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and the store of value. But if you read, say, what Janet Yellen said, she's now vice chairman of the Fed, that uh, if it were possible to take interest rates into negative territory, I would be voting for that. It means that the Fed will keep interest rates below the rate of cost of living increases, essentially for as far as the eye can see. And in that environment, obviously cash and bonds are dangerous. And then you have to move into asset classes like equities, commodities, real estate, art, collectibles, and so forth. Anything that essentially cannot be multiplied at the same rate as paper money that is uh, subject to the printing presses of Mr. Bernanke. <laughs> so what happens if the central banks start to raise rates? We saw the ECB do this yesterday. If the Fed comes <laughs> yes. in before the end of the year, when <laughs> most of the market is expecting it not to come in until at least late <laughs> this year, would that change your mind on any of these things? Not at all, because between June 2004 and uh, August 2006, the Fed increased the Fed fund rate in baby steps from 1% to 5 one quarter percent But there was never any monetary tightening occurring because the cost of living increases and nominal GDP was uh, increasing at the faster rate. The absolute level of interest rates doesn't tell you whether there's tightening or not. In China, they increased the interest rates already several times. But with inflation running at, say, between 8 and 10 percent per annum mm -hmm. and the deposit rate at 3 and a quarter percent, money is losing its purchasing power if you keep it on deposit. So I think in the U.S. you will have a similar process. One day they'll increase it by a quarter of a percent. But what does it mean it, when commodity prices are going through the roof, energy prices are going up, health care costs are going up? Insurance premiums are going up. Everything is going up. Only at the Federal Reserve is there no inflation. Hmm. I, I, yes, it, it's, a bitter, it's a bitter situation. Yeah, you just described, because um, we, we, I can certainly point to some of the, the positive aspects of the Fed action in QE2 in the equities markets and in the uh, the wealth effect that people uh, feel, given the really tough time that, that we went through a couple of years ago, and then that positive feedback on the overall economy when you feel a little bit better about your position. But we pointed out yesterday, uh, you know, if the market's at, uh, the Dow's at 20,000 and your do the dollar is worth half of what it was, it, it's kind of illusory that, that, uh, that you've made any money. Well... In gold and silver terms, the Dow Jones, over the last 10 years, has already lost more than 80 percent of its value. And yesterday, my friend Frank Holmes was on CNBC, and I don't know, don't remember if it was you or somebody else, but the two interviewers were kind of ridiculing him 
telling him that gold was a bubble and so forth. I just came now from a conference. There were over 200 people here in Singapore. I asked the audience, these are wealth managers, fund managers. You would imagine that they are intelligent. I asked them, who of you has personally more than 5% of their assets in gold? Not one person lifted the hand. Not one. If it were a bubble, a lot of people would have gold. The whole world would be trading gold 24 hours a day. But I don't think it's really a bubble. I think maybe gold is cheaper today than it was in 1999 when it was at $252. Wow. Um, Mark, I, I guess I, I'd have to ask you that we understand what got us into this mess, and that's the, the explosion in, in credit over the, the, over the past Correct. 10 years. Should we just accept then, or should the should central bankers have just ex accepted a five-year period of deleveraging where unemployment would be way too high f for anyone's liking and, and the misery uh, of all the, 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 you know, <laughs> of living through a period like that would be so evident? I think that's what the Fed and central bankers are responding to. Like, even in, in, in the ECB, there are plenty of people here that think that's a mistake to start now because the, the recovery, the global recovery is so nascent and, and questionable and fragile at this point. It's almost like our central bankers here feel pretty confident that they, they, they shouldn't be doing anything other than, than flooding the, the world with money right now they, because of 8.8 percent .8 unemployment. Are you sure we should live through five years of misery just to, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that we don't inflate too much? It depends whose misery. I mean, it would take me a very long time to go into details, but basically today, actually in the U.S., it's not an issue between Democrats and Republicans because there are many Democrats who are well-to-do people and there are many the Republicans who are not so affluent. It's a question of essentially entitlements. Uh, the majority of people, obviously, is not particularly well-to-do, so they want larger and larger entitlements, transfer payments, and uh, work less. And the people that have money are the ones that usually work very hard, and they don't want to have these transfer payments. So the people that have the money, say the 10% of the population that is affluent in the U.S., or maybe just the 5% of the population, they are outnumbered by the poor people, and therefore they have essentially no votes. So the one way to get back at the masses that all get these entitlements is to print money. Because by printing money and by outsourcing production to, say, China, you disenfranchise the working class. And by printing money, you let then asset prices go up. It could be real estate. It could be stocks. It could be commodities, whatever it is. And so your asset value increases dramatically. And there is wealth disparity that is increasing. But, Mark, you make this and sound like I a conspiracy theory. You think that this is an intentional? Well, it's not conspiracy. But look, if you clearly think about it, if you are well-to-do in the United States, you have exactly the same vote as someone who doesn't want to work that is born uh, illegitimately because in America, close to 50 percent of babies are born to women that are not married, and most of them are actually poor. So what kind of education these people will get? You have to ask yourself. But they have the same vote than someone who has, say, influence and affluence and has worked very hard all his life. So these guys who worked yeah. very hard, they say to themselves, the system is cheating us. We're going to cheat the system as well. Hmm. I guess that's one view on what's well, happening. It's a very we're, complex we're at, issue. We're at 50 percent of the people here do not pay taxes. <laughs> now, if you're at 50 yeah. percent and, and yet those same 50 percent will write in and call uh, people that make more than 250 that, that they're getting a free ride and that they're well, it, it, working very hard is one thing. Getting money back because of investments you've inherited is another. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that people wind up in good positions and not so great positions. And uh, Mark, actually, you've just laid out a very good uh, argument for making sure that we have strong public education to make sure everyone receives a, a well, strong what, education. What, what, what I really wanted to say is the tragedy is that the system has become dysfunctional. And the other day, CNBC interviewed Mike Steinhardt. He said it exactly the way it is. He said, 
we're not living in the America that America used to be. Something changed along the way, and everybody wants to rip off the system, and uh, that uh, leads then to essentially, and has also been encouraged by money printing. But basically, the well-to-do people in America, they benefit from money printing as well as elsewhere in the world because they can shift their assets overseas. The ordinary man doesn't have that potential. That's true. And, that, and hence the, the disparity that, that, that continues to increase in the class warfare and the, and the disenfranchisement that, that is uh, increasing as, uh, as well. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Mark Faber. We appreciate it of the uh, gloom. Uh, bo- uh, you got, it's gloom, boom, and then doom. I, it's not gloom, doom, and then gloom, boom. Gloom, boom, and doom. I think <laughs> gloom, boom, I think, and doom. I think doom should come after gloom. No, the website is clo- called gloomboomdoom.com, but the uh, report uh, gloom, boom, and doom. Uh, uh, there's always a wave movement. Okay, got it. All right. Thanks, Mark. Okay.